This is more so here because a lot of the times you'll have men, male patients come to you. They have a total testosterone, a DHT, they have estrogens, and the doctor never ran progesterone. The best test is a urine pregnant dial. I don't do it. Expensive. A blood test is damn good enough when you ignore the reference ranges by the labs because they're stupid. So, serum progesterone done at 8 in the morning. You will notice most reference ranges are abysmal. Less than 0.5 nanograms per milliliter. Most men are going to feel good at about 1.2. So anything less than 0.9 in my books with chronic pain, insomnia, things like that, I'm making a recommendation for progesterone. Now, interestingly, when we start looking at the lifestyle approaches, progesterone does come up really well when men and women, but I see this more in men, when they sleep better. So the blue light blocking glasses, reduction of lights in the evening, shifting the workout earlier in the morning, things like that will impact progesterone quite a bit. And so in some patients, they come in at 0.7 and I just, I just decide that we're not going to do oral progesterone. We're just going to really focus in on sleep and see what change we can get. Other times they come in at 0.9, but they have extreme anxiety. They have a lot of trouble sleeping and they're already trying sleep things and they're in a lot of pain. I'm okay adding in progesterone. Again, it's this whole concept of you're treating the patient, not just the lab test. <clears throat> Transcortin, which is uh, cortisol binding globulin, is actually the main transporter for progesterone. It's not sex hormone binding globulin. So you can't look at sex hormone binding globulin and make an inference on how much that's impacting free progesterone levels. Um, I, I really don't run transcortin that a lot because I just, I run this, I supplement with this if I need to, this improves, and that is good in 98% of my, my men patients, my male patients. You can look at the E2 to E1 ratio in men. Um, I sometimes do this. Again, I'm doing it a lot less lately, but you can look at that. So what we're looking for is an E2 to E1 ratio of less than 0.7. So basically, if we start to see estradiol climb really high and estrone doesn't, it indicates there might be a, a progesterone deficiency because progesterone is involved in keeping estradiol low and estrone a bit higher in that conversion. Same with testosterone, total testosterone to DHT. Progesterone decreases the conversion of testosterone to DHT. So if DHT is insanely high compared to testosterone, indicates there might be a progesterone deficiency. These, again, I'm typically not running to look at. If I really just want to know progesterone, I'm running this, and that's it. This is more so here because a lot of the times you'll have men, male patients come to you. They have a total testosterone, a DHT, they have estrogens, and the doctor never ran progesterone. And so instead of running a test, you can look at these to maybe get an inference on what's going on. In women, again, we kind of already talked about this, but we're looking at day 21 progesterone, 13 to 23 nanograms per milliliter in the pre-menopausal, and then in post-menopausal, anywhere between 1.5 to 8 nanograms per milliliter. Some women will feel normal at 2 nanograms per ml. Most are going to be upwards of 8 and maybe even a bit higher. I'm slowly, I think this is slowly changing for me where this is going higher. What you will commonly see on lab testing in women is that they have this bottom cutoff number and they're just less than that.
Okay, it's like with total test, which is not here, total testosterone sometimes, it's just like less than 10. Cool, does that mean 9.9 .9 or does that mean 0.9? Same with progesterone, you'll see that. How oh, it's, it's less than two or less than three. Okay, is it 0.1 or is it 2.9? So I've had to switch a few labs just because their assays don't, aren't sensitive enough to catch that lower stuff that I want to know.